Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Wagesbeck. I'm the curator of 20th Century Art at the New Mexico Museum of Art, and I will be hosting this evening's presentation. We're going to give just a minute to let folks uh, get logged on and let a few more people roll in, and we will be starting promptly at 6.01. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Christian Wagesbeck. I'm the curator of 20th Century Art at the New Mexico Museum of Art, and I will be hosting this evening's presentation with Lois Mano. I wanted to give everyone a brief overview of the presentation before we get going and what you can expect tonight. Tonight's program will last approximately one hour. Um, I will begin by doing a little background of our exhibition on Will Schuster. Then I will hand off the, uh, the talk to our headliner, Lois Mano. Over the course of either of our presentations tonight, uh, everyone is welcome to submit questions in the Q&A feature of the webinar. Uh, and that link should be at the bottom of your screen and it's two little word bubbles with Q&A. Over the course of the talk, I'll be collecting people's questions. And when Lois is done, we'll come back together and I'll uh, ask some of the questions and she'll be answering them and we'll go for uh, either as many questions as we have or until our time is up. So uh, without further ado, let's get going. So tonight's presentation is part of the programming around a fiery light, Will Schuster's New Mexico, which is currently on view at the New Mexico Museum of Art. This exhibition was put together to celebrate the centennial of Will Schuster coming to New Mexico. Uh, for those of you maybe coming from a background where you're not so familiar with Will Schuster, he was a fantastic character. Um, Will Schuster came west uh, in the early part of the 20th century for his health. So he was a native of uh, Pennsylvania. He fought at the Battle of Verdun in World War I, where he was mustard gassed and he lost uh, two thirds of his lungs. Whenever he got back to the United States, he immediately contracted tuberculosis. And his doctor told him that you really only had about a few months to live but if you moved out to a higher, drier climate, you could stick it out a little bit longer and perhaps even die of bad whiskey or snake bite. So he, you know, rolled the dice, took his options, came west to New Mexico, as so many did during that time to heal from tuberculosis. And there was this idea at the time that um, you can't, you couldn't really leave where you were healed or you would get sick again. So a lot of the early characters in uh, early 20th century Santa Fe history who came here to heal from tuberculosis ended up staying for the rest of their lives for just that reason. Anyway, he came out not really expecting to have very much longer, but he ended up living an incredibly long life. He died in 1969. And over the course of that life, he really dove into the art scene here in Santa Fe and involved himself not only in the arts, becoming part of the Santa Fe art colony, um, being part of uh, kind of the architectural uh, revolution that we've now gotten to know as Santa Fe style, um, and being part of several of the city's now most iconic civil, uh, civil parties that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but also um, just a beloved member of the art scene and an artist in his own right. Most of us probably know Will Schuster from his most endearing legacy, which is his obra, which we still celebrate today. And here I'm showing you uh, Will Schuster, kind of later in life, uh, standing next to the head of the Zobra, which he made. And here I'm showing you a more recent iteration of his uh, horrific creation. Um, and, Will, and Will Schuster's the Zobra is a wonderful kind of idea of, it gives us a great idea of what his mentality was and how he saw life, right? The Zobra is the embodiment of gloom and we burn it and it goes away. And when you think about the idea of somebody's biography, when they came out to a place to heal, when they had kind of the weight of the idea that they might not have a very long life on their shoulders, you can either kind of go one way or the other, give in and wait to die, or grab life by the horns and make the most of it. And that's absolutely what Will Schuster did. So 
when he was here in New Mexico, he engaged in almost anything that he could get his hands on. So of course, you know, building the Zobra and creating this fantastic community legacy is one of them. Uh, and one of the most fire-based, which I should say I think is interesting for this exhibition. So the title is A Fiery Light. And that meaning kind of comes from two places. One is the, um, the sheer presence of fire reoccurring in Schuster's work. And if you see the exhibition, you'll see that coming up again and again and again. So here's one example, fire at Busto Midway Cash Store, um, a portrait that he's done of the Zobra. It was a mural for um, El Nido up in Tezuke, um, but in later became part of the museum's collection. But we see fire coming up again and again. But the other part of this is a critique that he received from another beloved Santa Fe artist, Gustav Bauman, who uh, when Bauman was the head of the New Deal art program here, was reviewing some of Schuster's work and said of it, uh, and said particularly of some of the cave paintings that we'll be seeing tonight, Will Schuster will never set the art world on fire. Well, hopefully this exhibition on Schuster will prove Bauman wrong. And if you go in and you're either somebody who's loved Schuster for a long time and wants to be introduced to a lot of the work that he's made that you may be familiar with, whether it's engaging with the landscape of New Mexico like we see here in trees at Canyoncito, whether it's his devotion to looking at um, the local cultures and the indigenous cultures here, as we see in the paintings of some of his indigenous ceremonies like Santa Domingo, Domingo Corn Dance, uh, whether it's his engagement with the international and national art scene, uh, his relationship with people like John Sloan, who were some of the most popular artists in, the, in New York at the time, or his um, legacy of being so beloved in the Santa Fe art community. And that's expressed through Fremont Ellis's Adios Amigo Hasta La Vista. Um, Fremont Ellis was one of Los Cinco Pintores, which was the group that Schuster had a hand in founding and was one of Santa Fe's very first arts collectives. And here, this is Ellis's, um, Ellis's Ode to Schuster. It's his funeral, painted in 1969. And when um, Ellis's daughter was asked about the relationship between the two, she had said that her father and Will Schuster were two of the closest members of Los Cinco Pintores. And even though the group was short-lived, um, the relationship between Schuster and Ellis uh, was long and powerful, like Schuster's uh, impact on the arts community of Santa Fe today. But we're going to be speaking about another pair of uh, artists in Los Cinco Pintores a bit more tonight. Um, Schuster and Mruck. Uh, these two um, decided to take a very daring trip. So in the 1920s, they loaded up a car and drove down to Carlsbad, New Mexico. And now for any of us who are located in New Mexico, um, if you're anything like me, the idea of a road trip from Santa Fe to Carlsbad is no small feat. But to do that in the 20s was even more ambitious. And to do that in the 20s when there's somebody who's recovering from tuberculosis is even more ambitious. So the idea of doing this, going to this cave when it was first kind of coming into public attention is, is no small feat. And here we see the two of them kind of at the site, um, Ruck looking incredibly grumpy. I think Schuster looking incredibly dashing in his cowboy hat with that pensive look on his face and his roan glasses with the kind of lights that they would have used to explore the caves. And on that trip, they created paintings like these. And I'm not going to talk too much about them because Lois is the expert tonight and she's going to tell us all about them. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of work that they produced. And I just want to end this talk by saying that after they painted these paintings, um, Schuster was writing to John Sloan and other folks who were influential in the American art scene. And they saw these and they looked back and they didn't think too highly of them. And Sloan said, okay, well, you've proved that you can paint caves, but get back to doing what we think is popular. But when these paintings were exhibited at the New Mexico Museum of Art, um, and that's where I believe they were exhibited for the very first time in the museum where some of them are hanging again now, the public responded with an outpour of love. And there are um, articles from the New Mexican that you can still read today where they talk about these paintings by Will Schuster of Carlsbad Caverns being the best paintings that were ever hung in the New Mexico Museum of Art since it was open. Um, so I invite everybody who hears this talk tonight to go to see them in person because there's nothing quite like seeing a painting in the flesh and judge for yourself. But I will stop now and turn the program over to our real headliner and the person that you've all come to hear speak tonight, Lois Mono. And a brief introduction on Lois for anybody who feels like they need that. 
Uh, Lois has been a cavern volunteer at Carlsbad Caverns National Park for 25 years. She's a writer and visual artist. She also works at New Mexico Wild, a nonprofit dedicated to the protection of public lands in the state. As director of the Caverns Arts Project, Lois wrote grants and curated the conservation of many of the pieces of the park's art and photography collection, including works by Will Schuster and Ansel Adams. For several years, she oversaw the annual rehanging of the exhibit and wrote a book about the history of the artists at Carlsbad Caverns. And for those of you who are interested, that book is available in our bookstore and we will um, make the phone number available in the Q&A of this uh, presentation, but you can feel free to go down to uh, the plaza and pick that up at your leisure. Uh, I highly recommend it, it's a fantastic book. Um, she took up the strange hobby of caving when she was a college student in Texas, majoring in drawing and painting. And now, without further ado, I hand it over to Lois Mano. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate the introduction. Um, thanks everybody for uh, attending the program tonight. I wanna to give a special shout out to my many caver friends across the country who are um, also watching this tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be um, part of what's going on with the Schuster exhibit. Um, I fell in love with Will Schuster as a result of the research that I did, the more I learned about him as, a, as an individual, as an artist, as a creative force of nature, um, the more amazed I was. And knowing that he was as obsessed by Carlsbad Caverns as I have become over the years um, was just an extra bonus. So I'm gonna be um, sharing my screen and showing a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Hopefully all this technology is going to work perfectly. Let's see if I can figure it out. Takes a second for this to load up. Okay, now I wanna show it as the slideshow. All right, hopefully that is displaying properly for everyone. So thank you to Christian and fellow caver Chris Nail um, who's also part of the program um, organizing for this great showcase of Will Schuster and uh, for setting up this Zoom presentation. Uh, in the early 2000s, I made a proposal to the Park Service to help organize the park's art and photography collection in order to help fill a gap in exhibits for the newly renovated visitor center. The park had funding to do the renovations, but not to purchase new exhibits. Because the NPS managers already knew and trusted me from many years of my volunteer work, they were delighted when I told them I could come up with the funding to set up an exhibit of the park's own artwork. My background as a grant writer came in very handy. I raised enough money to conserve and archivally frame 25 prints by Ansel Adams, several large paintings by Will Schuster, along with um, many other pieces by lesser known artists and photographers. The offshoot of this extensive research that I did in the parks collection was a box of files that I decided would make a good book. So in 2008, Visions Underground, Carlsbad Caverns Through the Artist's Eye was published. And it has since won several awards. Uh, it tells the story of the artists and photographers who've been inspired by Carlsbad Caverns from around 1900 to today. So this image here that you're seeing on the title slide is by a very talented Texas artist and, and a caver named Tim Coates. Artists were instrumental in the creation of the national park system. 
the intrepid artists who traveled with early explorers of the West brought their images back East when they returned home. In the days before photography, these works of art were the only way to depict the natural wonders of the newly explored West. Paintings and drawings by men like Thomas Moran directly influenced Congress to legislate the creation of the national parks. Yellowstone being the first national park established in 1872 by President Ulysses S. Grant. Carlsbad Caverns became a national park in 1930. Artists continue to play an important role in promoting the national parks. During the Great Depression, the government established many programs to help put Americans back to work. This included artists and programs like the Works Progress Administration paid artists to develop images, celebrating the greatness of the American landscape. Will Schuster was one of the many artists who benefited from this program. When he was hired, he wrote in a letter to his friend, quote, 4250 a week from the government for painting. My God, it doesn't seem real. The day after I landed the job, I had to go to bed. You have to remember this was during the depression and it was not probably a really, really beneficial time for artists to be trying to sell their art. This uh, image here is uh, one of the, an example of the New Deal art, which included a series of posters designed to promote travel to national parks and other features across the United States, including Carlsbad Caverns. On the one hand, hordes of visitors to the parks created a great deal of impact to the resources there. However, it was critical to engage the Eastern population and create an atmosphere of national pride in order to assure the establishment of more parks and monuments, thus preserving large tracts of the West for future generations to enjoy. Early visitors to Carlsbad, known at that time as just the Bat Cave, in, had, uh, they had to endure a very long drive over rocky desert terrain to even reach the location. Then in order to actually get into the cave, they were lowered 170 feet below the surface by riding in a large metal bucket and winch used by the miners of bat guano. Many hundreds of tons of guano were removed from Carlsbad in its early incarnation as a guano mine. And they, those tons of bat poop were shipped to California to help start the uh, citrus groves in California. Here's a photograph of the guano bucket from inside the bat cave section, which is not part of the regular, regular tourist route today. To enter the bat cave, staff and researchers have to be current with their rabies vaccinations and wear protective gear like respirators. It is not a nice place to spend time. Here on the upper left is an early photograph by the photographer Ray V. Davis. I'll tell more about him in a minute. Uh, he chronicled the evolution of the cave from wild landscape to tourist attraction. Sadly, the cave suffered a great deal of damage in the early days during this process. Uh, if you take a look at that image in the upper left, you look at the floor in that old photograph, you can see incredible amounts of texture and formations and beautiful little knobby features. And there are also a lot of people in that photograph scattered throughout the formation area, standing around on the, on the ground and before trails were established, uh, a great amount of the floor surface in Carlsbad was basically trampled into a fine powder. And when you go through the cave today, you'll see areas like the King's Palace, where um, all those beautiful delicate formations that once carpeted the floor of the cave are, are now just basically sand. So I'm kind of sad that, that I missed the early days of Carlsbad Caverns because it must have been even more breathtaking than it still is. Carlsbad Caverns National Park has inspired artists since its early exploration in the 1900s. 
and it continues to inspire artists today as a World Heritage Site. This photograph on the left of the natural entrance at summer solstice from 1930 was taken by Colonel Thomas Bowles, the first superintendent of the park. The figure in the photograph is his daughter, Margaret, standing in this shaft of sunlight that penetrates deep into the cave from the natural entrance for only a few weeks each year around the solstice. On the right is a contemporary photograph from 2001, almost the same vantage point taken by Lee Watson. Carlsbad photographer Ray B. Davis worked with the discoverer of Carlsbad Caverns, a cowboy named Jim White, to put Carlsbad Caverns on the world map. This image from 1925 by the artist pioneer of early Carlsbad exploration, Ray V. Davis. He invented and modified equipment that allowed him to make black and white cave photographs of great clarity and beauty. I would say he was the only one of the early explorers who could equal the enthusiasm of the famous discoverer of Carlsbad, Jim White. Together, they made hundreds of photographs Davis printed postcards and other promotional materials with his own money to promote visitation to the caverns. The little figure on the right-hand side of this image, who's kind of squatting on his haunches uh, above that photograph or above the um, uh, shadowy foreground formations, that actually is Jim White in this photograph. This is a hand-tinted picture by Ray Davis of an area called the Fountain of the Fairies. It's one of the promotional products that Davis created. He made a bunch of these hand tinted images and bound them together into souvenir booklets for early visitors. So Will Schuster, he was the first person to paint the caverns. In 1924, along with his buddy, Walter Muck, who Christian mentioned earlier, he was lowered in the guano bucket down into the cave and poked around and became incredibly excited about the whole place. Uh, he, uh, he became kind of addicted. I mean, it was, it was a, definitely a, a source of obsession. He, he said that they, would go into the cave, they would spend hours and hours poking around in the dark, making sketches by lantern light. They would, they would come out and they would, he and Ruck would swear that they were never gonna go back in again. And then the next day they would get up and do it all over again because they could not stay out. Uh, in the lower left there is a picture of Schuster in his studio with one of his 1936 cave paintings. He actually worked a couple times at the cave uh, in, in, in stints, um, 1924, and then later in 1936 as a WPA artist. You can uh, discern his later paintings from the earlier works, primarily by the absence of developed visitor trails and lighting um, from his earlier works. The 1936 paintings very often contained um, portions of the paved trail, as you can see in that large painting. He's standing in front of in the upper right is uh, a lithograph by an um, Oklahoma artist named, named Mercedes Erickson. From what I could determine, she was probably the first woman artist to illustrate the cave, which she did in 1931. So that's, that's pretty exciting to find some firsts happening. A lot of firsts <laughs> took place in Carlsbad Caverns. The cavern was made a national monument in 1924 and became a national park in 1924. Schuster loved the cave. And I don't know if any other painter dedicated more time and energy to portraying the caverns over the years than Schuster did. He made over a dozen paintings, some of them quite large. He donated a great number of them to the National Park Service. Um, several were returned back to the family, uh, but um, there are, is still a, a, a sampling of 
incredible works uh, that Schuster made and, and generously gave to the Park Service. Uh, they were in storage um, in um, an Arizona archival facility for many years. And uh, through a bit of sleuthing, I was able to track them down. And uh, the superintendent of the park at the time um, uh, didn't know that the park even had a collection of Will Schuster art available to put up. So it was pretty exciting to sort of help these pieces return to be repatriated back to their to their park in New Mexico. That was, uh, that was a really exciting thing to be part of. Um, Schuster was fascinated by the cave and he couldn't understand why his paintings weren't as popular with the critics as some of his other work was. Um, Schuster stated, quote, the cave has made a cubist, vorticist, and post-impressionist of me against my will. In 1925, an exhibit of Schuster and Walter Mruck's paintings was shown at the museum in Santa Fe. Apparently, Schuster was less than pleased by the mixed reviews the show received. In a letter, his friend and artist, John Sloan, gave him this advice. Sloan wrote, quote, I suppose you had hoped too much from the cave stuff, and it blewed you to have the bottom fall out of your hopes. Just forget it. Put them away and come to the surface of the earth again. Perhaps it's time for me to tell you that I never could really understand your interest in the bowels of the earth. I did like the pictures, and I saw how you enjoyed painting them, and I'm sure they were great technical exercises and well done, and I felt you had to get them out of your system. But if my advice is worth anything, you can have it. Come back to human life. I'm not sure that I would agree that they were simply good technical exercises. I think that they were pretty masterful. Um, but it is also very difficult for people to relate to the images of, of cave formations, especially if they've never been underground or if they've never been to Carlsbad. Uh, it's just hard to have a frame of reference if you've never visited. Um, Will Schuster, however, was not the only famous New Mexico artist who was inspired by Carlsbad Caverns. Raymond Johnson was Professor Emeritus at UNM and established the Johnson Gallery in 1950 on the campus. It was New Mexico's premier modern art exhibit space at the time. This image here, which is a triptych that measures 180 inches in total width. It's in the collection of the Albuquerque Museum. This was the second trilogy of um, Johnson's 16 works spanning 46 years, during which time Johnson eventually discarded his interest in nature-based representational forms in favor of pure abstraction. I had the the pleasure of being able to view these enormous paintings um, at the Albuquerque Museum. And uh, they're, they're really, really spectacular. Very exciting to see. And we're gonna move away from painting and touch a little bit on some of the photography. Um, Ansel Adams, one of the icons of American and international photography, had this quote I wanted to share. Our time is short and the future terrifyingly long. Believing as we much must that things of the heart and mind are most enduring, this is the opportunity to apply art as a potent instrument of revelation, expression and perpetuation of wilderness actualities and moods. Through art of brush, pen and lens, each one no less than another, we possess a swift and sure means of touching the conscience and clearing the vision. Ansel Adams um, created photography at the cave uh, in a span ranging between 1934 and 1936, uh, and again in 1941. This is one of 25 original signed prints in the Carlsbad Caverns art collection. Adams was unhappy with his cave photos, and he compared shooting the cavern to, quote, photographing an illuminated stomach. In a letter to, photo, uh, to fellow photographer Alfred Stieglitz, who happened to be married to Georgia O'Keeffe, Adams wrote, 
quote, this I must photograph, pray for me. Um, he was sort of at a loss about how to attack subject matter as vast as Carlsbad Caverns uh, without some of his own you know, bag of tricks. I mean, Ansel Adams was known as the master of natural light. And here he is now um, having been contracted to take photographs of an area in which all the light is artificial and there is very little sense of natural scale. Uh, it made him cranky, let's just say that. The photos that Adams made at the cave in 1941 were intended to be part of the mural project, which was to be installed at the Department of the Interior's office in Washington, DC. However, World War II intervened and the project was never completed. Uh, a series of photographs from the cavern by Ansel was narrowly saved from destruction by a diligent park employee named Ron Kerbo, who went on to become the park's cave specialist for many years. Around 1978, he found the prints stashed in a cabinet, the contents of which were, were destined for the trash bin. When he realized what he'd found, Kerbo put the envelope of prints on the desk of the superintendent, who waved them away without looking at them, saying that there was nothing worth keeping in that cabinet. Ron suggested that the superintendent take another look and the prints were saved. So that's what these prints are that are now conserved and permanently in the park's collection and uh, represented in my book. Here's another from that selection, um, a veiled statue by Ansel Adams. Ansel hated using human models in his photographs, but there was no better way to communicate the sense of scale in the images than using the human form. So he relented and was forced to make that compromise in his aesthetic vision. This is a photograph of uh, the visitor center, um, which includes the elevator house. Ansel may not have been happy with the images, but they are still beautiful representations of the park in its early years. This shows the original native stone architecture of the first elevator building, which is actually entombed within the structure of the existing visitor center. A portion of the existing native stonework remains visible in an exposed wall inside the new visitor center structure. So you can't actually go and see this building any longer, but you can see a part of the stonework. This portrait of the cave's first superintendent, Colonel Thomas Bowles, was made by Ansel Adams and is in the collection at the University of Arizona's Center for Creative Photography, which houses Adams's archives. Colonel Bowles was a tireless promoter of the cave and reigned as its superintendent for 20 years until he was transferred over dispute about the singing of the hymn, Rock of Ages, as part of the cave tour. Though it was incredibly popular with park visitors, the singing of a hymn was not considered to be appropriately secular as National Park Service refined its interpretive policies. Um, unfortunately, Colonel Bowles just flat out refused to um, adhere to the demands of, of his uh, uh, supervisors. So he ended up being um, demoted and sent to a smaller park. I believe it was Hot Springs, Arkansas or something like that. Uh, so that was a, that was a loss. He was a huge fan of Carl's Back Caverns and really put it on the map. This is an image of the big room that was taken by a photographer named Tex Helm. This photographed re required 2,400 flash bulbs and 13 synchronized cameras. 150 people occupied the scene for this revolutionary 1952 photograph that appeared in National Geographic magazine. Sylvania Electric Products donated the 2400 flash bulbs for this photo project in a bid to promote the new technology over the traditional flash powder and magnesium ribbon that was in use at the time. This photograph, I'm, I'm sorry, this painting is titled Cavern Interior by David Klein. It was done in 1968. 
It is acrylic on canvas and measures 48 by 60 inches. It's interesting because acrylic paints were pretty new on the art scene when this painting was made. The beauty, the beauty highlighted by a painting or photograph brings the viewer into the experience being shared by the artist. The cave is no longer a frightening alien place because it's being interpreted through the eyes of a fellow human. Interestingly, a lot of people who visit Carlsbad Caverns as tourists um, over the years will admit that the main thing that they remember is the restrooms and the underground lunchroom because it has the maximum amount of infrastructure and recognizable features. Once they get out into the wilder part of the cave, it's so disorienting that um, a lot of the visitors kind of blank out. They, they just can't even process what they're looking at. Visual art isn't the only medium used to celebrate caves. Poets, musicians, and writers have been inspired by Carlsbad Cavern. Many musicians find the cathedral-like acoustics of large underground chambers irresistible. The Haydn Oratorio Society of El Paso performed Haydn's creation oratorio in the big room in 1933. For many years, the hymn Rock of Ages was sung as part of the cave tour, which was ranger guided at the time. At the time. And we all know how that worked out. Um, but it was very, it, it, the, the acoustics of a large cavern are, are really spectacular. And I can see why musicians have been so drawn to places like that. Art transcends culture and borders to promote an appreciation of the natural world and our national parks. In 1954, a young Japanese man named Toshi Yoshida visited the caverns and was inspired to create a woodblock print of the cave formations. Yoshida came from one of Japan's premier families of printmakers, and his work is in art collections worldwide. This print was purchased amazingly on eBay for a couple of hundred dollars and is now part of the park's permanent art collection. This was one of those exciting bits of research that I did over time and just stumbled on this print for sale um, on eBay. So it's again, really fun to see things like this getting put back into the context of, of the park from, from which they originated. This is a scratchboard drawing that I made um, in which I blended the surface of the desert with the cave environment below, sort of trying to tie them together with a thin layer of stone and uh, showing the bat flight at dusk, sort of kind of trying to communicate some, a more abstract concept like that connection between the surface world and the invisible features that are underground. This print is also for sale through the Museum Foundation store for a, uh, for a brief time. During my time curating and bringing together this collection, I uh, contacted many contemporary photographers who are caver friends of mine. And I was blown away by the generosity of the many photographers and other artists who donated dozens of their works to the parks collection. Uh, as an example, um, we have an image of a cave pearl um, by the photographer and cave explorer, Kevin Glover. Um, on the right is a photograph of a formation, very popular formation called the totem pole taken by uh, the cave explorer extraordinaire and professional ceramic artist Peter Jones, who uh, I'm pretty sure is um, watching this right now. Peter comes all the way from Maine um, multiple times um, and volunteers, donates his time and photography skills uh, to the Park Service as well as the Forest Service. And he is one of those magnificent contributors that helps keep the wheels on the, on the, uh, on the wagon uh, at Carlsbad Caverns. So, hey to Peter. In fact, volunteers uh, are the backbone of conservation in many, many parks all over the country. Um, 
it takes uh, a lot of people giving their time uh, to help the Park Service manage its resources properly. And so my hat is off to uh, everybody who contributes so many hundreds and hundreds of hours to keep our parks um, in, a, in a way that we can all enjoy them. This photograph by Ron Kerbo, who I mentioned earlier as the savior of the 25 Prince by Ansel Adams. Uh, he also uh, took some very beautiful photographs while he was at the park. Uh, this photograph celebrates the beloved bat colony at the cave that numbers several million strong when it's there in the summer. Um, these Brazilian free-tail bats use the cave for their maternity colony, giving birth to their pups in early summer. Then they migrate to Mexico for the winter each year, come back every summer. They were also the source of that guano pile that was what resulted in the uh, original exploration of caves, of, of Carlsbad Caverns. Uh, the main part of the exhibit space in the renovated visitor center can be seen here. Um, the collection is not currently on display. I'm hoping to get that uh, resolved uh, soon. It, it uh, had to be taken down to be put on exhibit at another museum and uh, we just haven't gotten around to putting it back up, but that's definitely on my to-do list. Uh, there are historic posters, magazine ads from the 1930s. It's not just fine art, it's sort of a, uh, an, a, a, an exposition of uh, showing all the different ways that they, the caverns were promoted in various media. This quote in the right, I think I might be covering it up with my image, sorry. But the quote is, in the end, we will conserve only what we love we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. That is by the Senegalese environmentalist Baba Dioum from a speech given in 1968. This painting of the Lake of the Clouds um, is uh, inspired by uh, the deepest point of Carlsbad Caverns. It's over a thousand feet below the surface you access it through um, uh, crawling, caving, walking, and uh, over 600 feet of uh, high angle rope work. So it's not part of the visitor tour, uh, but it's very much worth visiting. There's a photograph of me during um, a video project at the Lake of the Clouds that was done a few years back. Uh, it's a spectacular place. The deepest point in that lake is about 11 feet. And again, kind of giving a little bit about some of the other work that I've done at the cave. Uh, as I said, volunteers contribute thousands of hours to public land stewardship every year. One of the most fun projects I've done is uh, I was directing the, um, uh, the, the cable camouflage project in which I and dozens of volunteers would go to the park for long weekends and we were covering up the electrical cables that were exposed as um, part of the installation of a new led lighting system that was put into the cave a few years back about seven years ago um, the electricians were contracted to put in the lights but they were not contracted to hide the results of their work and that resulted in literally miles of exposed ugly black cables sneaking across the formation areas. So our groups would go in and uh, we would hide them using the natural materials in the cave. Uh, here's a kind of a before and after photograph. You can see on the left that really ugly black cable bundle. And on the right where we had basically uh, covered it over, buried it below grade and used other kinds of magic tricks to make it disappear. That volunteer project took over three years and had hundreds of volunteer hours involved. Uh, this is a piece of uh, glass, fused glass that I did recently. It's a six by six inch um, fused glass tile painted with enamels inspired by Carlsbad Caverns. Visions Underground tells the story of the artists and photographers who've been inspired by Carlsbad since 1900. 
The National Speleological Society, NSS, is a sponsor of this publication and also gave money to um, put the exhibit together. Uh, the NSS is um, an international um, uh, compilation of um, membership of cavers um, from all over the world. And they do great work um, everywhere, education, conservation. It's a really great organization. And this is a copy of the cover of my book. And at the very end, I'm going to finish with another image by Will Schuster. Visiting a cave can be a life-changing experience. Will Schuster first saw the bats flying at Carlsbad Caverns in 1924. In 1961, getting near the end of his life, he made this small painting as a gift for his sister and entitled it Bat Flight. Almost 40 years later, Will Schuster was still thinking about the cave and still thinking about those bats. And I think that that speaks volumes about how moving it can be to become familiar with, to become intimate with a national park and an environment like Carlsbad Caverns. It has certainly changed my life. And uh, uh, I, I feel a kinship with Will Schuster um, for the, the way that it obviously affected him for his whole life. And that concludes my program. Thank you so much, Lois. That was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it and I learned so much about artists that I had never heard of before. So that's always a great treat and learned a bit about some artists that I thought that I knew really well, um, but people are always a surprise. So now everyone, we've got uh, a few minutes left for Q&A. So if you have any questions about Lois's program or anything associated uh, with tonight's program, uh, go to the Q&A box. It's at the bottom of your screen. It's got the two little chat bubbles, put it in there and, um, uh, I will present those to Lois and we can get your questions answered. In the meantime, I wanted to remind everyone that if you wanna come back and reference anything that you heard tonight, this video is being, um, it's being recorded and it'll be made available on the museum's website and through social media. So just look back there and we'll provide you with those links. Um, the other thing that I wanted to thank Lois for other than her fantastic talk is all of the volunteer work that she's done to make this site such a fantastic place. So on behalf of myself and the museum, thank you. And thank you to all the volunteers who I'm sure are listening tonight for all that you do to make this New Mexico natural wonder um, what it is today. Well, so, it's so fun. We feel very lucky and honored to even be able to do the fun stuff that we get to do and go off trail. And yeah, that's, uh, we get as much as we give. Well, good. Okay, so we do have some questions, Lois. Oh, go, no, go ahead. Do you have a, no, I think we could keep the, um, the slides up in case we need to reference anything. All right. Um, so the first question is, well, okay, this might be a me question, but it could be for both of us. Did Schuster work primarily in oils? So the answer to that is he worked a great deal in oils. He was also renowned as a printmaker and he did a lot of work in engraving. Uh, and also lithography and drawing. So he kind of went across media. Um, so most of the work that you might see are oils, but there are also a lot of prints out there, prints and drawings. But Lois, do you have anything to add to that from maybe what you've come across Schuster's work? Um, no, I, I think that's accurate. I mean, he uh, uh, did some really wonderful, um, you know, lithography and uh, all sorts of, he, he would really dabbled in many things. I mean, puppeteer, you know, he was doing mixed media constructions. Was, he was fearless. He did everything, really. <laughs> True Renaissance person. Okay, I'm glad somebody asked this question because if they didn't, I was gonna ask it. They were photographs of cave pearls. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are places in Carlsbad Caverns, well, and in other caves uh, where, well, uh, geologists who actually disagree on the origins of certain formations because they're, the reason why they grow the way they do is not entirely understood. Uh, the current um, belief is that um, microbes actually influence to a great degree 
the shapes that formations take as they're growing. Uh, the, the general formation uh, process though is water dripping into a, a cave void from the surface, uh, deposits a, um, a, a very thin film of mineral, um, usually it's calcium, but it can take other forms as well. And uh, airflow, evaporation, the mineral content of the water and a lot of other factors, including microbes, uh, affect whether that material is deposited as a stalactite hanging from the ceiling, as stalagmite coming from the floor, or as a cave pearl. And a cave pearl is very unique uh, formation uh, that you find in some cave pools where uh, a tiny particle of some material gets agitated in the water by dripping incoming water, and it gets coated by progressive layers of calcium, uh, calcite, just as the formation of, an, of, of a pearl in an oyster, which is why they're called cave pearls. Um, but I believe that, that there is some other factor than just the agitation of water, because in many pools where there's water dripping, there are no cave pearls. And in other places, you'll see thousands of cave pearls all over the floor of a, of a pool. Some are the size of the head of a pin. I've seen them as large as golf balls. Uh, so they're, they're really a, a kind of a fascinating and weird. I've even seen cubic cave pearls. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy thing. There, there is a lot about caves we truly don't yet understand. Well, that's great. Yeah, and that, that image of them was just beautiful. Isn't um, it? Okay. Right. So the next question we have, any idea when the, car, the Cavern Art Project will be set up once again in the Visitor Center? Well, there are a lot of factors that are in play there. I mean, um, the Carlsbad Art Museum uh, hosted an exhibit of the Cavern Arts Project several years back and a lot of the work uh, came down and then maintenance decided that that would be a great opportunity to repaint all the walls in the visitor center. So they did that. And then uh, the superintendent um, was diverted into other things and it just has not been um, high priority, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. I periodically check in with cave managers to see if you know the timing is good and the will is there for the art to get put back up because it is a pretty daunting project to hang dozens christian you can relate to this yep. hang dozens <laughs> of pieces of art in a large space and having to do the title cards and everything and it's a lot of work and uh, you know every time we would rehang the exhibit it would take four people three solid 12-hour days to to do it so uh, I'm hoping that maybe after the pandemic, we'll have a chance to see it. Oh, I hope so. I would love to be able to see it again. Okay. Would you like to come is... and help us hang it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Tell me. All right. Okay. Uh, these are two questions that I'm going to put together because I think that they kind of piggyback on each other. And I think they're very good ones. Uh, can you explain on what you mean when you say that Jim White discovered Carlsbad Cavern? I see native art in the entrance today. And then another question, um, were there any signs of early human life found? Well, um, yes, there is uh, artwork at the, and in the natural entrance. There are some uh, uh, dim but still visible pictographs mm -hmm. um, made with, with red ochre. Uh, there are um, uh, mescal pits um, very close to the, um, the, the, the natural entrance. Uh, so yeah, the, um, the Apache um, and other tribes um, were active in the area for many centuries. When, when I say discoverer of Carlsbad Caverns, I'm, I'm referring to you know, what we would consider to be the historic Anglo discoverer of Carlsbad Caverns um, right. from, you know, around, around 1900. Um, and, and Jim White, you know, the, the story is that he was you know, riding the range one evening and saw this big dark cloud on the horizon and went to check it out thinking that it was a wildfire and realized that it was millions and millions of bats flying out of a hole in the ground. Wow. 
yeah so that's that's sort of the the discovery story of of uh, Jim White and uh, then it was you know the cave was exploited as a guano mine um, for several years and Abijah Long was the guy who um, established the first guano mining claim and Abijah Long actually declared that he was the discoverer of Carlsbad Caverns and so uh, you know there's a it depends on who you ask. Right, right. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left in the program, Lois, but we've got three more questions. If you don't mind going over a little bit, uh, can we tackle three more? Absolutely. Great, okay, I'll just do them in order then. Um, has climate change affected the caverns at all? Also, how has the bat population been changed over the time with tourism? Okay, um, climate change has definitely impacted the entire state, I mean, right. the world, of course. Um, we, just in the, the decades that I've been working at the cave, we've definitely seen uh, a drop in the water levels of many of the pools in the cavern. Um, there, there are formation areas that used to be wetter than they are now. There is seasonal fluctuation in that. Um, but yeah, there've been a lot of hydrology studies of the water flow um, going into the cavern and definitely the the drying of, of the Southwest generally is, has been reflected um, at the park. Um, and the bat population, I, I don't know that, that tourism per se has been much of an impact on the bats. Um, I would say that agriculture and pesticides um, have been a, a greater problem. Uh, of course, bats consume, you know, tons of insects every night when they go out on their flights. Uh, they're, they're very, very effective predators. And um, you know, a lot of their favorite prey are agricultural pests. So you know, there's a certain amount of, of um, you know, access to foods that you know, they prefer, um, loss of habitat, both in the United States and in Mexico has been an issue for you know, these bats, which migrate back and forth uh, every year. And so the population definitely has diminished. Um, it swells and shrinks each year, depending on a lot of factors. Um, and you know, bat counting by itself is a kind of a tricky business. I mean, generally you, you measure a, an, a certain area of the ceiling in a cave and then you count the number of bats that are roosting in that section of the ceiling, and then you multiply it by the rough surface area of the roof. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a precise science, uh, but, you know, the, the general idea is that there were once, you know, maybe up, upwards of 6 million bats, and now maybe we've got closer to 3 million bats. Mm. Again, depends on what day of the month you're studying, whether you're studying the count before the pups have been born or after the pups have been born. So it's a, it's a moving target. Okay, thank you. Okay, this next question is kind of a two-parter too. Okay. Um, do you have any insight into how Ansel Adams actually managed to illuminate his images in the, not the notoriously difficult to light cave environment? And the second part is, are those prints that you showed us, are the only copies of them at the art center, or are there also copies at like the CCP in Tucson? Um, Ansel, his photography was done um, with, a, with various types of lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I wrote about that in um, my book. Uh, I, would, I would have to go back and really just kind of go through the pages to be able to tell you precisely. Um, I'm not a photographer, so I, I don't wanna you know, misstate what sort of lighting he was using. Sure. But if, um, if folks are interested, um, uh, John Woods, who was a personal friend of Ansel's and is also a caver, um, wrote a, a, a guest segment in my book about um, Ansel and his photography at the cave. Okay. And the second question, part of that question was, it was about um, where, where those prints are now. You uh, said that they found those prints um, and that they're at part of the cave collection, 
But are there also copies um, at the CCP or anywhere else or maybe negatives? Not they that we totally are lost. aware of. They, they were 25 prints. They were literally just, they, each one was um, uh, mounted on a piece of mat board and signed. And they were in a folder. Um, they, are, they are scuffed. Um, they're not in you know, their best shape. Um, mm -hmm. No negatives. Gosh. Uh, we're pretty sure that they are the only extant copies. Um, in fact, for my book, I actually had to do um, flatbed scans of each one of the prints because we couldn't find any, anything else. And um, there's, there's no pressure like Photoshopping Ansel Adams. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, in over my head. <laughs> Gosh, imagine just to think that that whole kind of chapter of his career would have been lost. That's it's a close call. Yeah. Okay. Pretty so, exciting stuff. I mean, there are other photographs of Carlsbad Caverns around. These are not the only photos, you know. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of, you know, a lot of those are, you know, at the in other collections. Great. Okay. Last question. Um, during Schuster's early uh, visit, what type of lighting did he use? And then the second part is, and how documentary or true to life were the images? Are they expressionistic at all? Well, um, in uh, the, the photographs of Schuster that um, Christian showed and, and that you could see these big kerosene lamps, mm -hmm. um, those lanterns are what they hauled into the cave. Um, I, 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 Christian and I were actually talking about this and that, that Schuster would not have done any paintings in situ, uh, mm -hmm. but um, he mentioned that, that there are sketches in uh, Schuster's sketchbooks. Yeah, I can speak to that just really quickly, that the, the Museum of Art holds uh, all, all that I know of um, that exists from Schuster's sh sketchbooks that he brought back from the trip, and they're full of... Um, you know, a great deal of preliminary sketching, some of them just in pencil or charcoal, some of them in color. So you get a sense for him thinking about the way that that'll translate later. Um, but for the most part, what they are are very specific small scenes. So I get the idea that he might have put together uh, some of those, you know, larger works from, you know, more kind of uh, specific drawings. You don't see too much kind of overall composition work, which I think is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and tells us a little bit about how he would have focused with that little bitty light that he had. Mm -hmm. And as far as the accuracy of how he portrayed the cave formations, uh, I can often look at a Schuster painting and say, oh, that's the Devil's Spring. So mm -hmm. he really was pretty true to the shapes of the forms. Um, however, he did take great liberties with the colors. Um, so, you know, some of the, the blue tints uh, of some of the formations and the greens and the reds. Um, for the most part, Carlsbad Caverns is shades of white, cream, gray, and gold with some mm. deep reds in there. Uh, so anything beyond that kind of ochre-ish color palette is, is going to be invented. Right. Okay. And I would add, um, just from my own studying of the paintings that, uh, you know, if you go to the exhibition and in the slide that I showed earlier, you can compare the paintings that Merck did with Schuster's. And there you can kind of get a sense for how naturalistic Schuster's were because Merck's were so expressionistic and inventive and a lot more kind of fantastical. So I like that kind of duality. Okay, and those are the questions that we have. So Lois, I just wanna thank you again so much for this fantastic program. Oh, I well, want to remind everybody that this is gonna be online, but if you want a little bit more, please um, go to the museum, bookstore, pick up Lois's book, pick up a copy of that beautiful print that she showed us. And if you have time, pop in and see the Schuster exhibition. And I want to thank you, Lois. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. And thank you, everybody who tuned in. Um, and please keep an eye out for more programming from the museum. And everybody have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.